five unsolved missing persons mysteries from the 1990s. There was grunge, no pandemics, and plenty of plaid back in the 90s heyday. While times may have changed, back then people went missing all the time. Some of them found, others to remain a mystery. These are five unsolved missing persons mysteries from the 90s. Number five, Heather Teague. It was August 26, 1995, when 23-year-old Heather Teague went sunbathing at Newburgh Beach in Henderson County, Kentucky. At five foot two, she was a tiny girl with long brown hair and green eyes. Near the area, a witness looking through a telescope was observing the beach from across the Ohio River at 12.45 p.m. when he saw a Caucasian male approach Heather. This man grabbed her by the hair, then dragged her into the woods at gunpoint. The witness said the abductor was about six feet tall and approximately 200 pounds. He had brown hair with a bushy brown beard. He was wearing jeans, but with no shirt on. Oddly, he was wearing a wig and mosquito net while abducting Teague. As soon as the abduction was reported, police searched the area and found a piece of Teague's bathing suit. There was additional evidence found, but nothing that led to where she was taken. One lead, however, that police found was a piece of surveillance footage from a local farmer. This farmer had set up a camera hoping to catch people vandalizing his crops. In one of the tapes that day, he captured Heather's car with a red Ford Bronco just up the road. Police later made a routine traffic stop of Marvin Ray Dill, a Henderson County resident, driving a red and white Ford Bronco. Upon searching his vehicle, they discovered two guns, knives, a roll of duct tape, rope, rubber gloves, as well as hair resembling Heather's. Some blood stains were found on the inside tailgate, but it's unclear if this belonged to Heather. Even more damning, Dill resembled the composite sketch of Heather's abductor. As police received more tips about Dill's involvement in Heather's disappearance, they headed to his house for further questioning. When Dill found out police were on his property, he told his wife to leave. Immediately after she left, Dill committed suicide by shooting himself in the head. After his death, evidence was compiled and presented to the prosecution. Although his wife was called in as a witness, she pled the fifth and didn't answer any questions about Dill's involvement in Heather's disappearance. Most of the circumstantial evidence pointed to Dill as a suspect, but another man was linked to the case as well. Christopher Bello, also from Henderson County, was suspected to be involved in Heather's case. Turns out, Bello, Teague, and Dill had similar acquaintances. On the day Dill committed suicide, Bello left Kentucky. What's more, he was later charged and sentenced for involuntary manslaughter and the death of Catherine Fetzer, a married woman he was having an affair with. He later claimed to have shot Fetzer and disposed of her body, and it has never been found. Investigators believe Bello may have killed and abducted other women as well. Many of his suspected victims were young women with dark brown hair, just like Fetzer and Heather. Despite the suspicion, Bello has never been charged with Heather's disappearance or the other women aside from Fetzer. There are others that believe Dill and Bello may have abducted Heather together. Later on, Heather's family filed a lawsuit against Kentucky authorities citing a cover-up and malfeasance. They believe there are at least two 911 calls related to the case, but these were never released to the family. Heather's mother thinks that officials focused on the wrong suspect in the kidnapping and failed to follow up on leads that would have taken the investigation elsewhere. Today, Heather Teague remains missing. Number 4. Damien Nettles Damien Nettles only wanted to have a good time. It was Saturday night, November 2nd, 1996, when the 16-year-old headed out to a party with good friend Chris Boone. They went over to West Cows on the Isle of Wight and proceeded to visit several clubs, hoping to get served alcohol even though he was underage. Despite his age, Damien was pretty tall and was often let in and served while his friend Chris was left to wait outside. By 10 p.m., a CCTV captured footage of Damien walking inside Yorkie's chip shop. Inside, he was seen picking up a salt shaker, setting it down, and then leaving. At 10.30 p.m., he caught up with Chris outside. 
His friend wanted to go home because he was cold and wet. He convinced Damien to go with him, and the two walked out of town. They parted ways around Northwood Park, where Chris went home directly. He was sure Damien also headed through the park to go home, but what he didn't know was that Damien actually turned around and headed back to Cow's High Street. Damien was seen on CCTV footage again inside the chip shop a second time that night. By then, the patron said he looked heavily intoxicated. At 11.15 p.m., a witness saw him trying out the car handles of a blue Ford Fiesta in the parking lot of the Harbor Lights pub. Afterward, he was spotted at a bus stop close to the co-op. At one point, he climbed on the bus, took a photo of the driver, and then got off thanking them. A minute before midnight, another witness saw him at the bus stop again. This time, he was huddled in an area eating chips. Afterward, the teen approached the car where the witness was and told him twice, they are watching us, before wiping rain from the car window and walking off. According to this witness, the teen looked drugged, and he last saw him walking towards the Pierview public house. CCTV footage captured Damien walking on the street before vanishing. When Damien didn't return home, his mother called Chris's house. As hours passed and still no sign of him, the family began searching. By November 3rd, they filed a missing persons report. According to friends and family, those first few days, the police didn't take the matter seriously, and it was family friends who went around looking for clues about Damien's whereabouts that night. Dr. Karan Lawrence, a friend of Damien's mom, found the video footage from the chip shop. For some time, police maintained Damien might have gone into the water and drowned instead of foul play being involved. Later on, one of the last tapes capturing Damien alive that night went missing. The police had simply lost it. The prevailing theory at the time was that Damien had fell into the water since High Street, in some areas, was just seconds away from the water. The family approached a harbor master to help out. According to harbor master Captain Henry Wrigley, he calculated tidal movements, sets and rates, as well as various possibilities in case Damien slipped into the water. He said that even if Damien had fallen into the water, his body would have returned to land at some point. However, his body has never turned up. Over the years, Damien's case has remained open. The relationship between the police and his family has been strained since the family felt the police bungled the investigation from the start and it was too late to recover from that. Rumors also circulated about what happened to the boy. Some said he was a victim of a drug deal gone wrong. An informant said Damien was accidentally killed by a dealer and his body buried on a bike path. Another rumor said he was the victim of a sexual attack and was buried close to a Northwood house. But the most prevalent rumor was that he was killed by a local drug dealer named Nicky McNamara after an argument. McNamara has since died, but friends of his admitted that during the time, he and his crew dealt drugs on High Street. Damien's case remains open, and his family is still hoping that at some point, they'll find out what happened to him. Number 3. Jody Hooson Truitt Jody Hooson Truitt first moved to Mason City, Iowa in 1993, and it wasn't long before she landed a job as a TV anchor woman working for the morning news. On June 27th of 1995, the blonde and brown-eyed anchor woman overslept and was running late for work. Her co-worker, Amy Coons, called her since she needed to be at work by 4 a.m. that day. Amy said Jody sounded fully awake and that she didn't notice anything wrong. But an hour later, Jody still hadn't arrived. Amy went on to anchor the news, covering for Jody. Later that morning, when there was still no sign of her, the news director headed to her apartment. Instead of finding her, though, he discovered some of her items scattered around her car in the apartment parking lot. It looked like there had been a struggle. Police were notified and an investigation and search was immediately started. Local police, the FBI and hundreds of volunteers helped search for Jody, but they couldn't find any trace of her. There were few leads in Jody's case. A partial palm print was found on her vehicle as well as some hair. A witness also reported seeing a van idling in the parking lot while several others heard a scream. Unfortunately though, 
no one call police. Through the years, several names have popped up as potential suspects. The first was Jody's friend, John Van Sees. Despite being older than her, the two were close. He even named a boat after her, and it's believed he was the last person to see Jody alive that night. In 2017, a search warrant was issued for GPS data for two of his vehicles. The information has never been released, and it's unknown whether police are still treating him as a suspect. The other person possibly linked to her disappearance is convicted rapist Tony Jackson. He lived just houses away from the TV station where Jody used to work and had allegedly confessed to his cellmate he was involved in the anchorwoman's disappearance. While no evidence directly ties him to the disappearance, Jody's case remains active. More recently, billboards featuring her case were set up in Mason City, Iowa, hoping that it will lead to new information about her case. Number 2. The Lost Boys On March 17, 1995, after a night of partying, six teenage boys decided to have some more fun. 17-year-old Jay Boyle, 18-year-old Chad Smith, and 17-year-old Robbie Rumbolt were from Pickering, Ontario. The other boys, Michael Cummins, who was 17, was from Oshawa, while Danny Higgins, who was 16, was from Ajax, and Jamie Lefber, 17, was from Scarborough. The boys decided to go down to the beach that night looking for an adventure. At least three of them were caught on a surveillance camera entering the East Shore Marina at 1.48 a.m. An hour later or so, local residents living in the area heard the sound of a motor on the lake. The next morning, there were two boats missing from two different marinas. Although the boys were reported missing the next day, the police didn't take it seriously. After 36 hours of them missing, a massive search was then underway. The lake was searched, but they couldn't find anything. Thousands of volunteers had come in to help look for them, but nothing was discovered. No boats, no clothes, and no bodies. The only thing discovered was a gas can belonging to the Boston Whaler, one of the boats that had been stolen. According to authorities, the boys likely separated into two groups, each group entering two different marinas at the Frenchman's Bay to steal a boat and go on a joyride. One group took the four-meter Boston Whaler motorboat and the other a three-wheeled paddle boat. It's believed once they were in the water they encountered an accident of some sort and drowned in the icy waters of the lake since they didn't have any life jackets. Despite the huge search though, no clues ever turned up and the missing teens were then dubbed as the Lost Boys. In 1998, families were given some hope when a set of human remains were found in the Niagara River. One set of remains was said to have been wearing red jeans, similar to what Jay Boyle was wearing the night the boys disappeared. Meanwhile, another set of remains was also discovered nearby. It would take years before the DNA was finally tested, but it didn't match Jay Boyle's or any of the other boys. A GoFundMe page has been set up asking for help in the re-examination of the case, and today, it still remains open. Number 1. Mikkel Biggs It was January 2, 1999, when 11-year-old Mikkel Briggs and her little sister, 9-year-old Kimber, thought they heard an ice cream truck in the distance. The two girls asked for money from their mom and headed outside to wait for the truck to pass by. The girls decided to wait near Toltec Street and El Moro Avenue, just close to their home. It was already 5.50 p.m., and while Mikkel was circling on the street on Kimber's bike waiting for the truck, her little sister stood by. After a while, Kimber felt cold and decided to return home so she could get a coat. When Kimber got inside, her mother asked for Mikkel and told her to turn around and go get her sister. But when she returned, she couldn't find her sister anymore. Her bike was on the street on its side with the wheel still spinning, close to their home in the street corner they were waiting at. Quarters were strewn about on the road, the money Mikkel had for the ice cream. It had only been a total of 90 seconds that the two sisters were separated. Kimber told her parents immediately and within minutes police were searching the area close to the home. Search dogs were brought in and they could only trace Mikkel's scent within a few feet, suggesting she was grabbed and placed inside a vehicle and then taken away. 
At the time, authorities weren't able to confirm if an ice cream truck was present in the area or not, but ice cream vendors were cleared, as well as known sex offenders in the vicinity. False leads then began to pop up surrounding the case. By January 9th, police had dug up what looked like a fresh grave, but there was nothing, and then a copper-colored jeep that was seen in the area was traced, but the person was ruled out as a suspect. With the consent of homeowners, a neighborhood home search was then done. Only one person refused this search, however, and he's not thought to be involved in Mikkel's disappearance. In March, there was a report a man had tried to abduct two girls from a schoolyard, but this turned out to be a hoax. Although two sketches were released of a possible suspect, this was never publicized enough because police weren't sure if these people were connected to the case. Mikkel's father, however, believes the man responsible for taking her was D. Blaylock. Blaylock lived just two blocks away from Mikkel's family and was a registered sex offender. He had prior convictions in different states, and by 2012 he was convicted for raping a neighbor and attempting to kill her. Blaylock denied the accusations, and he's currently in prison. With no solid leads in the case, Mikkel's disappearance and abduction has remained unsolved. On the fifth anniversary of her disappearance, Mikkel's family held a funeral with an empty casket, believing she had been killed shortly after she was abducted. In 2018, her sister Kimber stumbled across a photo of a dollar bill on Facebook, which had a note scrawled over it and what looked to be a child's handwriting. It read, I am Mikkel Biggs, kidnapped from Mesa, Arizona. I'm alive. The name was misspelled, and Kimber doesn't believe it's from her sister, but still, there's a glimmer of hope at the possibility that her sister will return. Today, Kimber is a mother herself, and she says she never lets her child out of her sight, even just for a few seconds. So there were five unsolved missing persons mysteries from the 1990s. These missing cases are still active, the victims' families still looking for answers and hoping one day they'll find out what happened to the people they love. If you like this video, then hit the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. We have new videos coming out every week on Wednesdays and Saturdays that we know you'll want to check out. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.